I, you know, I think a lot of folks might say like, oh, I'm not qualified for that. I don't know if I can do that job. And I would say like, if you're interested in it, people should go for it because you should do something in your career that scares you because it helps develop the confidence and it helps you develop new ways of navigating through ambiguity, new ways of leading the team that make you a much stronger leader on the other side. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. One of my favorite events here at the College of Business is our Gilkey Lecture Series. Longtime supporters of the University of Montana, Harold and Priscilla Gilkey, established this series in 2004 to enrich business education at the College of Business by providing students, faculty, and the community with access to amazing business leaders. Past Gilkey lecturers include REI CEO and Interior Secretary Sally Jewell, Missoula native and co-founder of BlogHer Lisa Stone, founder of Right Now and current United States Congressman Greg Gianforte, and many others. This year's Gilkey Lecture speaker was set to be Laura Orvitas, CEO of Onyx Maps. Though that event was postponed, Laura was kind enough to share some time with the podcast. There are so many valuable lessons in this conversation. In her 18-year tenure at Amazon, Laura played a key role during the formative years of e-commerce. She made the move to Onyx in 2018 and is now leading the company through a major growth phase. We talked about culture, scale, and how to thoughtfully take a brand into new markets. Laura's story is a great one. We're excited to have her as a business leader here in Montana, and I'm excited for you to learn more about her right now. Okay, so we're here today with Laura Orvitas. Laura, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So really excited to to have you today, although we were more excited to have the Gilkey Lecture, uh, to have you on campus for an event this week. And we can't do that, but I'm glad you were able to free up time to speak with us today. You are the CEO of Onyx Maps. We'll get all into that. Um, But I wanted to learn a little bit more about your story. I mean, you've been at Onyx, what, about two years now? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Two years after um, a fairly long length of stay at this small e-commerce company called Amazon.com. Well, it it was smaller when you started than when you left, I suppose. What, you joined Amazon in what, 99? That's correct. Yeah, 99. I've worked there for seven years. Took a a short break when I followed my husband down to Tucson, Arizona, um, where he was completing his residency, and then came back for another decade. Wow. So what, in 99, what made... I mean, you were working, I think, in Boston at the time in, in, as a financial analyst or a financial consultant. What made Amazon, um, what put it on your radar? And why did, why did you say yes to an opportunity there? That's a great question. I had a friend who had left the company I was at called the Parthenon Group and um, started working at Amazon. At my management consulting firm, I had worked on the burgeoning internet uh, marketplace as well as education. And uh, the internet was interesting to me. I had a friend who was living there and my best friend from kindergarten was also living in the Seattle area. Okay. And I had always wanted to go West. I grew up in the Chicago area um, where, you know, you can see for miles and miles because it's so flat. I lived seven miles away from the city and on a clear evening, I could see the, uh, the, the top of the Sears tower from my house. Uh, and I'd always wanted to come west, be closer to the ocean, be closer to the mountains. And uh, my friend said they're hiring at Amazon. And I said I should just try this. And I thought I would go for two years and then maybe go to business school or do something else. Uh, but I ended up staying there for obviously quite some time. Yeah, talk a little bit about what Amazon was like in 99. I mean, people think of it as, well, it is this behemoth now and employs so many people. And it's just such a ubiquitous presence in all of our lives. Um, what was it like in 99? I mean, it was, what, like six years into its existence at that point? Yeah, in 1999, um, it had primarily been a bookstore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had launched some international locations as well as a uh, music and uh, video store back when people bought physical things. CDs and, and so forth, uh, yeah. <laughs> CDs and, yes, and DVDs. 
And it had really just started its consumer electronics and toys business, which was the first of what they called the hard line. And I joined um, right at that time when they were um, trying to expand beyond a media company. And in the world that we were in, we were considered to be a very small player. And I remember um, when I worked on the toy team, working with large manufacturers and trying to pitch them on why they should partner with us now because we were going to be something in the future. Meanwhile, um, there was a lot of chaos in our fulfillment center network. We had five fulfillment centers across the United States, and we were having a hard time shipping product during our peak season. So we would ask employees of Seattle to come down and work in the distribution centers over the holidays to ensure that packages were sent to customers. Wow. Yeah. So it was kind of a wild time. Indeed, indeed. And so, yeah, you were in the ground level with Consumer Electronics, and that's where you ended up in your in your last role with the company. You was vice president of Consumer Electronics, which I think when you left was something like a billion-dollar business. I mean, that that is enormous. Yeah, it was actually much bigger than that. It was equivalent to a Fortune 100 company. Wow. Uh, which is, yeah, it was kind of crazy. And I also managed a technology team. I managed a private label uh, our private label um, global program for hard lines. So if you've ever purchased something from Amazon Basics, that was my team that made that. And I also managed a team that uh, was in charge of learning and development across that consumer organization globally. So it was, I, I came in as a financial analyst and, and left the company almost uh, 18 years later, managing a very large team and very large product portfolio, which was really, really exciting. So talk a little bit about the sort of, you know, the attributes and skills that you, you sort of brought to Amazon and, and developed over your tenure there that, that led to your success. Because the, you know, a lot of people have been successful there, but your rise was meteoric and created a ton of opportunity for you um, currently at, at Onyx that we'll talk about. But what were some of the attributes you think led to your success there? I think management consulting provided a really great business framework for me. I was a biology major and I was also, along with my siblings, one of uh, the first to go to college. My parents did not go to college. So I didn't know very much about the world and how things work. And management consulting exposed me to a number of different industries and a number of different business frameworks that helped me kind of understand how companies run and how you analyze data and how that data can be used for making business decisions. So when I came to Amazon, I was super excited that I was gonna bring this you know, amazing toolkit to the company. And when I got there, I found that uh, a lot of the people at Amazon had come from similar backgrounds and different backgrounds and uh, I was just keeping up with my toolkit. It was sure. a, uh, Amazon was a very data-driven driven company. The parts that I think Amazon does really well, but, which is not surprising, is customer obsession. Mm -hmm. They really do make decisions based on the customer and stay focused on the customer, which I think has helped. Um, I have applied that in many decision-making frameworks that I've used across Amazon and outside of Amazon. They also are a very data-driven company, and uh, that somewhat levels the playing field in that anyone who has a good idea can present it. As long as you present it using data and using the customer, you have a reasonable shot at getting that idea worked on and moved through the company. And then the third thing that Amazon did really well was scaling the culture and ownership across the massive organization. So I think it probably is still the world's largest startup, but even when it was multiple, multiple, multiple billions of dollars, you still felt like you had a lot of autonomy to make decisions and a small team of people in which to implement those decisions. And I think that was, is one of the reasons why it has been so successful. Yeah, that last piece really resonates. You know, I know of a variety of people that work at Amazon or wor have worked in Amazon in so many different areas over, you know, a, a large number of years. And 
yeah, that consistency with regard to the focus on the customer and being data driven and some of those core attributes that you you just laid out there. It's amazing that sort of everybody's on script in a way that uh, has to mean that there's not actually a script that it's that it's deeply embedded in the culture. Yes, it definitely is. And we used to joke that we would hire senior people who would try to come in and say, like, this is what was successful for me. And it was a little bit like organ rejection if you didn't drink the Kool-Aid fast enough and get part of the culture. And it wasn't that we didn't value people. It wasn't that they didn't value people's experience. It was just that there was a way of doing something and you, you had to be part of that way in order to be credible and trusted in the company. And then you could bring kind of your expertise on top of that. Okay. Well, let's talk about your, your current gig and why you decided to leave. So a couple of years back, um, you know, Onyx was, was on the heels of a major funding event that we'll get, uh, get to in a moment, but yeah. Why did you decide to, uh, to leave and take a leadership role in, in a venture like Onyx? Yeah. A lot of it was about learning. I had spent so much time at Amazon and I kept getting opportunities to get in larger and larger um, positions or different positions. And I felt like I was on a really massive learning curve. And uh, towards the end of my tenure there, I had asked myself a question whether I'm going to be a lifer and continue to stay at the company Mm -hmm. or if there's other experiences that I wanted to have. And I decided that I, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to work at a smaller company I wanted to stay in technology. I wanted to work with a a venture capital firm. I wanted to work with a great team of people. And my husband is a a fifth generation Montanan, grew up in Helena, Montana. During my career at Amazon, I uh, had two kids who um, at the time, well now are eight and four, So we wanted to get closer to family if that was a possibility. So when the Onyx opportunity was presented, it really checked a lot of the boxes professionally, as well as checking the personal boxes to come to Montana. And uh, as a family, we were looking forward to spending more time in the outdoors. And what was it about? Yeah. What was it about a smaller company that was attractive? Was it just something that was so different than Amazon or was it, was it something you went into you know, maybe Amazon felt that way when you started. Yeah. What was it about a smaller company that was attractive? Yeah, it, it's really about, um, I love uh, being able to wrap my arms around the people and the team. Mm-hmm. And in the different experiences that I've had at Amazon, the part that I loved was the hyper growth phase and taking ideas and then being able to scale them to a larger level. And that's kind of the intrigue of a smaller company uh, that there's a lot of the makings of a great business, but might need some help in figuring out how to take that business and and grow it for outsized um, results in the future. Indeed. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that. So first, before we get into it, give us the overview of of what Onyx does. A, A lot of people know about it. You know, it operates in the map space and kind of is strongly associated with the hunting community. But, um, you know, in your view, what do you think Onyx does? Yeah, well, our mission is really to awaken the adventurer inside everyone. And uh, through our Hunt app, we provide information that allows hunters to plan to find new places to go hunt to navigate offline when there's no cell phone reception and be able to know where they are, know where they stand, know the property boundaries and be able to get back to their truck and home safely. And we also allow tools to kind of relive the trip or remember the trip by being able to to save waypoints or take photos and store those within the app. So, we believe we're doing the same for off-roaders today. So we look at ourselves as a mapping company, but even more than that, being able to really empower our users to have a great day in the in the outdoors. Hmm. And so you joined, like we said before, right after was a little over twenty million dollar funding event. I think primarily Summit Partners led that round. You know that sort of event for a startup really changes the nature of the venture and, and, and what its what its objectives are 
I mean, what what does an event, what does a funding event like that mean for a startup? Yeah, it, it has been great. The the part that I think capital can run a Mac if not managed properly. Mm -hmm. And the great part about Onyx is for eight years, it was a bootstrapped company. So it really had embedded in its culture more of that bootstrappy mental model where you were carefully weighing your investments. We're a a pretty seasonal business with um, the hunting business. So from a capital perspective, what that means is we, have a dry spot of capital through the summer months until we get to our peak season. And then we're able to replenish the bank account since we're in a recurring subscription business. So capital for us gave us a way of being more confident in the investments that we were making in the off season, knowing that we had a cash reserve and could pay that back during the um, peak season. It also gave us more confidence to hire in advance of uh, invest in some of these other areas like our off-road business and not have to worry so much about the ROI, the short-term ROI of those investments and rather focus on the long-term ROI of those investments and um, help us grow and expand in that, in that matter. The other thing that it gave us um, is the board of directors mm-hmm. and that um, they've been really great at one, holding us accountable for our business results But also, um, since Summit and our board has purview to other companies, they're able to help us learn faster by telling us what's going on in the larger ecosystem of apps and consumer businesses, so we can apply that learning and learn even faster. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about the the role of the board of directors, who's on the board, and kind of how that how that um, how that is kind of taken shape with your with your role there? Yeah, so our board uh, is there's two members from Summit, one who's a board member and one who's an observer. And both of those folks are very actively engaged in the company. They've helped us think about corporate development opportunities. They've helped us interview candidates. They're helping us recruit new board members who may have some interesting mapping technology and skills. We have another gentleman um, who works at Yellowstone Growth Partners who helps a lot of Montana companies and beyond scale their businesses. Mm-hmm. They have kind of a consulting for equity model, uh, and he provides another lens of operating businesses that's been super helpful. And then Eric Siegfried, who's the founder and still works at Onyx, uh, he's on the board along with myself. So we have kind of a small but mighty board, and it's been just really nice for me to have a group of individuals who really understand our business to help uh, make key decisions or advise, provide sounding boards on the key decisions, and also make sure that we're continuing to have a long-term growth strategy. Sure. And, and you mentioned that the, you know, the, the financing helped sort of smooth out some of the cyclicality in your revenue. That makes sense. The seasonality of the business. You know, when it, when a company gets an infusion of capital like this, it, how does it sort of change the uh, the growth mindset? I mean, I'm sure you, you, there's there's uh, there's an imperative to provide a return to the investors, and a few other new imperatives. How does that kind of change? Um, does it change the culture? Does it change how, how the company operates? Um, it's 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 vision in any way? How does that kind of play out? Yeah, I think in this instance, it didn't change the vision or a lot of how the company operates because we were bootstrapped for so long and we wanted to hold on to that like ability of bootstrapping. I think for some folks with this capital infusion, maybe there's been a sense of relief and a little bit of a loosening of the, uh, of the cash constraints, if you will, which Mm -hmm. myself and the CFO have tried to make sure we provide a good balance, but just because we have capital doesn't mean that we should fund everything. We still need to keep a high bar for what we're investing in. And it does mean that we have two sets of customers. We now have a a broader set of shareholders who were responsible for returning business results. So I think it's up to the level of accountability that we have in addition to providing value to our customers. And it's great that our shareholders and our customer 
uh, our shareholders are aligned with that we need to focus on the customer to get the best business returns. I think there are some um, boards that may not have the same alignment uh, with, the, with their objectives and that could create some interesting tension between the operators of the company and the shareholders. Sure. And I, I suspect over time we'll, we will have some tension there as uh, there's different um, priorities for the, for, the, for the shareholders versus the customers. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, those sorts of tensions can be really productive. I mean, they can be a feature rather than a bug of the system. I mean, that's kind of why you have one of the reasons why you have a board of directors. Exactly. I love productive tension. So let's talk about um, scale. It's a word we hear often in business. It's a word we hear particularly often in tech. Um, I want to talk about how Onyx scales or in your view, how it scales, but let's talk about in general. Um, some businesses scale and some don't. I mean, I think it's one thing that sort of the the novice business student or the lay observer just sort of assumes that all, all business models can scale, um, but that's not necessarily true. What are some attributes of business models that um, sort of lend themselves to scale and, and what are some that don't in your experience? Yeah, it, this is a great question. because I think I'm not even sure people have a consistent definition of what it means to scale. Yeah, I'd agree. So, I kind of want to, I want to start there um, and I'll tell you what my definition is and would love to get what your perspective is if it's different, but I really believe that scale is about the ability through process or technology to do more with a smaller set of resources. Mm -hmm. So you change the model from a linear model to an exponential model. How do, you, how do you think about scale? Yeah, I think of it the same way. I mean, there's some sort of classic sort of economic theory that lends to it, whether it's economies of scale, meaning the more units you produce, it costs you fewer, uh, it costs you less dollars per unit to produce. Um, that can take the form of experience curves. Like you get the more repetitions you have producing a product, the better at it you get. So it costs you less, you have more skill. Uh, then there's scale in terms of material costs. So if, if, you're, if you're producing more and you're buying more raw materials, you're paying less per unit of raw materials, so it scales. Um, and I think the way you're thinking of it as well, like can you produce more volume of a product or service with the same number of employees? Or can technology, as you mentioned, allow you to, do, uh, to continue that growth with even fewer employees um, or employees per unit of output or however you think about it? So yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Oh yeah, I, say, I have um, I have a couple examples that I uh, that it could help illustrate kind of what it means to scale in in a more uh, tangible way. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was when I was running the home business for Amazon, we our mission was to add a ton of selection to the platform, and the we were managing millions of ASINs, uh, which are an ASIN is an item, and thousands of vendors. And I had a team that I could count on my fingers with both hands to be able to manage the vendor negotiation. And our top vendor represented less than 2% of our total sales of this category. Wow. So there really wasn't an 80-20 rule uh, that you could apply to get the big economic value of driving a negotiation and better gross profit optimization. So I challenged our team to figure out a way that we could negotiate with all these vendors. And we knew that we couldn't do it on a one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. So the team did a really nice job of structuring a process that uh, relied on kind of asynchronous communication with the vendors. And we were able to negotiate with a much larger group of vendors. And after we figured out that process, for the home team, we were, tried it with several other different teams to see if it worked. We made some modifications with it. And then we were able to go to our tech team and put in an automated version of this process to enable it to work for all of the categories across Amazon. Kind of similar playbook, I wasn't involved in this, but it's, I think about Amazon's launch into Prime Now, that's a delivery service that um, gets things to same day, uh, 
they started with one city and they worked a long time to perfect the processes and the technology to enable that one city for growth. Mm -hmm. And then there was kind of a unit of operations and that unit could be applied to other cities. And they took it slowly at first to see, you know, does that, does Seattle look like LA? Does LA look like New York? Does New York look like um, Denver? And once there was enough um, credibility that the unit was, was properly working then the gas pedal was applied and multiple cities sprang up and a nationwide coverage was performed. A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hi, this is Jeff Meese, media technician at the College of Business, and you're listening to A New Angle. At Onyx, we're using... Uh, a bunch of the cloud technology to enable our maps to serve millions and millions of tiles. And a tile is uh, a, an area of the map that's served on your cell phone. Okay. And you know, in in before these technologies were there, we would have had a, a massive cost disadvantage because we would have had to buy and maintain our own server farms to be able to service our peak demand. But today, because the companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Oracle have invested in these the cloud technology servers, we're able to have very cost-effective ways of scaling our business and not have to pay for that for the entire year because we can just use what we need yeah, at let's any given time. Yeah, let's explain that a little bit more. We had a... Uh, a couple months ago, we had Michael Punk from Amazon Web Services on, and he was explaining how the cloud works as far as, you know, sort of being able to handle that flex, that, that, those, those surges and fluctuations in demand much more effectively than any one organization could plan for itself. So yeah, get into the dynamics of how that plays out with how it, how Onyx is trying to serve more and more tiles to, to more and more people and, and sort of the cyclicality of that service as well. Yeah, so we see both a seasonal pattern with our usage as well as a weekly pattern with our usage. Hmm. Because our product is, is enabling people to get outside, a lot of our peak usage occurs on the weekend. Sure. In e-commerce company, a lot of the peak usage actually occurs on a Monday or Tuesday. So if I were only um, having to build my own server farm, I would have to build the capacity that I needed for my Saturdays and Sundays and pay for that capacity throughout the entire week. And because it's so seasonal, or there's such a big peak during the weekend, I would have a massive underutilization of my servers. Companies like Amazon can take that aggregated demand across e-commerce companies and companies like myself and say, I can have one server farm and I can dedicate portions of the, the capacity to companies that need it the most. So they could direct the most amount of servers to the e-commerce company on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then I can share that server demand on Saturdays and Sundays when I need the peak demand. And that helps lower the cost to serve for everyone and helps really maximize which, what effectively is a fixed cost of, uh, of servers and operations across, um, across all the companies. So you know, that helps uh, smaller companies like ourselves be able to compete with larger companies and actually kind of levels the playing field a little bit from um, that economies of scale perspective that you were uh, mentioning at the beginning. Yeah. And it seems too that, you know, with a product like yours, a service like yours, you know, serving a tile, a map, um, a location ping um, to, to, to an additional customer does not necessarily cost the business as much as you get in return from adding that customer. Like you don't necessarily have to add a new employee every time you add a new customer. It's not like 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of people love to talk about Uber, their value proposition versus their business model, and you know it's unclear if if Uber really scales in the sense that they still have a lot of costs associated with each additional ride. You all don't have a lot of additional cost with each additional subscriber. Is that is that a fair kind of assessment? And from a fixed perspective, yes, there is a variable cost that goes up with each of the new subscribers, sure. but that is you know, that is less than what you would have to do from a fixed cost for sure. And that's part of the reason why we're excited to expand into other markets because our technology and our mapping, it, we believe can be extendable to lots of other places of recreation. And we focused on off-road and we're learning right now how well that, uh, that our playbook for Hunt applies to the off-road segment. And we have realized that we need to add a lot more content on specifically off-road trails, which we've been working to do over the last six months and really um, be able to deliver an amazing customer experience. Yeah, let's talk about that kind of the you know, new markets. You know, it's sort of, you know, when I was introduced to the company, I think it was back in like 2012 or 13, it, it was called Hunting GPS Maps. And... You know, I was relatively new to Montana. The value proposition seems super clear. You know, hunters need to know where they stand. Is it okay to harvest an animal in that spot? Are they legal? All of those dimensions. And you know, how do some of those um, how do some of those benefits uh, manifest in, in other markets? Yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, one of our features is the ability to save a map on your mobile phone so when you don't have cell phone signal you can see where you are and the map uses the gps in your phone to be able to pinpoint you on the saved map so that kind of technology is useful for any time you're in the backcountry mm -hmm. without cell phone signal uh, we have the ability to create a track so you can see where you've navigated and that works both offline and online and that can be useful for any outdoor recreationalist. The um, trails, uh, which are also in our hunt product and in our off-road product, are helpful to know how you access various pieces of land or to know if you can do the type of activity that you want to do on there, whether it be horseback riding or off-roading or um, hiking or biking. These are all things that you need to know um, to make sure that you are being a kind of proper land steward, if you will. Mm -hmm. So those are types of features and functionality that we believe easily um, extend into other outdoor recreation activities. And in fact, um, on a recent survey that we did with our hunt users, there wasn't a single uh, survey respondent that said that they only use the app for hunting. They use our hunting app for fishing and for camping and for hiking and all sorts of other activities um, aside from from just what they do during the hunting season. And and how do you then think about the brand in these different in these different markets? I mean, I think about um, other outdoor brands have moved in and out of the hunting market. I mean, you've got a brand like Under Armour that was hugely identified sort of initially with, with football and then basketball and ball sports. And they moved, they moved successfully into the, the hunting market. And then other brands have sort of been in the hunting market. I think it's um, Sitka, for example. And they've been hesitant to move out of it, even though a lot of the attributes of their apparel would function well in, in a ski coat or you know, hiking clothes or, or things that are, they're not so quite um, heavily identified with hunting. How, how have you thought about putting the brand in different markets and, and your approach to that? Yeah, we believe that Onyx stands for, you know, again, the kind of awakening the adventure inside everyone. And by thinking about our mission that is broader than just hunting, we have started embedding that into our brand strategy. And the team did a really nice job before I started rebranding huntinggps.com to Onyx with the 
um, future vision of being able to extend that brand into other markets. We've done a fair amount of market research to see if what consumers think about hunting and what type of crossover exists in different activities. Right. And we've found for the most part, the majority of consumers are supportive of hunters if they are using, if they're, if they're hunting for food and sustainable food. Mm -hmm. We have found that, that people are not as supportive of hunting if you're hunting for trophies or for what considered more kind of personal gain. That with some of that data, we've said, you know, we believe that uh, what we're doing is helping people hunt for sustainable food and that therefore we can extend the brand into other areas. We've had some exciting um, unanticipated surprises as we enter the offer segment where some big brands and partnerships have saw that we have a new app. They've used our hunting app and they've contacted us and said, we really want to partner with you guys. We've been waiting for you to do an offer at app. And um, that's been kind of really exciting and a positive surprise that we yeah. didn't think would happen so soon into our tenure of the, of the new product. You know, it's, it's interesting, like we said before, the, the sort of white hot center of the brand was initially this, this hunting market. And I really like the mission statement of sort of awakening adventure in everyone. And it's, yeah, the ability to navigate and figure out where you stand is, is, is ubiquitous across so many different uh, outdoor activity categories. The move into off-road seems like a slam dunk. As you think about movement into other markets, whether it's backcountry skiing or running or cycling or whatever, there has to be sort of, well, I would assume there might be some tension with your your core market of hunters. Do hunters sort of view the brand skeptically as, as it, um, or is there a risk of hunters sort of viewing the brand skeptically as you might consider other marketplaces? I think there's always that risk. The way that we're managing around the risk is the product that is focused on hunters is made by hunters for hunters, and we will stay customer obsessed with that, that product. We intend to launch additional apps to service those other customer segments, and those apps need to be equally focused on the customer. So part of our part of our uh, next wave of the company is really learning about what are those things that we don't have yet in the app that really can make the experience great for an off-roader or for a backcountry skier mm, yeah. or for uh, a runner. And some of those things might not be relevant to some of the apps and some of them may be relevant for all apps. And that's going to that's gonna be the challenge that we figure out um, over the long term. But you know, from a hunting perspective, that is our core. We don't want to lose sight of that customer. And as we've thought about how we organize the company, we are making sure that we keep a team of people focused on hunters and the hunting experience. So we don't get distracted with new market pursuits and forget kind of who made the company what it was. And what it is. yeah, and it's it's you're probably fortunate in the sense that you, you being headquartered in Montana and Bozeman and Missoula, you've got a, a workforce that uh, operates in so many of these categories where you could scale the business to. So, um, staying relevant to hunters um, while you're sort of maybe pursuing backcountry skiers. Well, a lot of those hunters are also backcountry skiers. So it's it's it's. I think you have a, a tailwind in that sense with, with regard to these categories, but also the workforce that you can draw from here in Montana. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's great being headquartered here in the state of Montana where there's so many outdoor recreationalists. And it's one of the things we actually hire for is we look for passion and we look for passion in the outdoors. You don't necessarily have to be a hunter or you don't necessarily have to be an off-roader, but it certainly helps that a lot of our employees are users of our product and can continue to be focused on that customer experience. Yeah. Speaking of that, what have been some things that have sort of surprised you most about uh, relocating to Montana and trying to do business um, on a large scale from Montana? Oh, that's a great question. 
One of the positive surprises has been the opportunity to engage on a larger um, front with the community. So um, it, we've been able to participate in some of the panel discussions that the Economic Development Council outside the governor's office has put on. I've had the opportunity to connect with both universities and help under, help the universities understand what we need from an employment perspective for the future. And the other Montana CEOs have been very friendly and welcoming, uh, able to strike up conversations. And it feels very much that everybody's rooting for everyone else. And uh, that was a, a positive surprise. I hadn't really anticipated that, that there was a big kind of nice tech business community here. Uh, you know, we still struggle with recruiting folks into Montana, especially from big cities. Mm -hmm. And some of the um, comments are that, that people are concerned that there might not be as many jobs. If this one job doesn't work out, they've relocated their whole family. Um, that feels like a big risk. Some folks are ready to make that move. Um, so we've had to be more strategic about hiring Kind of trying to find the right person at the right time at, to to relocate here. We also have um, supported remote workers, so we can continue to meet the demand of the company. It's not the majority of our workers, but if we find a great candidate who won't relocate, um, we'll entertain whether they they will make a great remote worker, so we can continue to um, fill out our hiring plan. Yeah, and and speaking of your your kind of collaboration with the universities. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, you've worked for a consulting firm, you've worked for a large growth company for many years. Now you're with, um, you know, we can't really call Onyx a startup anymore, but um, a company that um, smaller and in, in, that, in, in that rapid growth phase. What advice would you have for students at, at one of our state universities thinking about careers locally? thinking about the sort of skill sets and coursework that they should be acquiring and the mindset that they should be building to prepare themselves for success? Yeah, I, I would encourage students to optimize for learning. There may be a job that is offered to someone that's not the perfect ideal job that someone dreamed up, but that student will learn from that experience and that learning will help connect the dots later on in life. I would also encourage folks to do something that scares you. One of the kind of scariest job transitions I had was when I went into our web services group. And I went in there when uh, the group was really a startup within Amazon. We had just one product out. We were working on the cloud storage system and um, uh, S3. And uh, I really was unqualified for the job. I didn't have, I didn't really know how to describe a web service. I didn't really understand what a developer did. And I was, uh, I ended up being a technical product manager without any technical skills. Hmm. And you know, developers would come to me and say, like, my deployment failed. I need your help. And What's I'm like, that? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea how to manage a deployment. But I had to reinvent myself. I had been on the finance and product management side prior to that. And I had to reinvent myself and learn new ways of getting things done that didn't rely on the skill set that I had studied or that I had known. I had to learn new things. I had to rely on other people's expertise to get things done. And that, um, you know, that was a pretty scary experience. And I didn't know if I was going to be successful um, during it. But the learnings that I had on that have helped me in so many different um, job transitions since then. So I, you know, I think a lot of folks might say like, oh, I'm not qualified for that. I don't know if I can do that job. And I would say like, if you're interested in it, people should go for it because you should do something in your career that scares you because it helps develop the confidence and it helps you develop new ways of navigating through ambiguity new ways of leading the team that make you a much stronger leader on the other side. It might not be the most fun job you've ever had, 
but it will be one where you grow the most as a as an individual. And then uh, I, you know, this maybe kind of ties into that, but you know, saying yes rather than no more often times, mm-hmm. and figuring out what under what conditions you can get to yes. Uh, you know, I left Amazon for a while. I wasn't thinking I was going to go back. But a great, they rolled down the red carpet. I walked down that red carpet that led to another decade of learning for me. Uh, when I, was, I ran the, the music and DVD teams and the, my manager asked me to go take over the home team and I wasn't like really in the right mindset to go to a new job. I wasn't looking, I was really happy. I was I'd just done my annual plan. I was excited about what I was gonna lead the team through on merging digital and physical media together. But I said yes. And that the experience on the home team was an amazing experience for me. And then again, they asked me to move to the consumer electronics group. And I I had to think about it for a little bit and said like, I'm going to do this because I'm going to learn more in that way. And even the move to Montana was one where, you know, there was a lot of, there were some Mm uncertainties, but saying yes, uh, rather than saying no, I think opens up a lot more doors and puts you more into that kind of growth mindset versus a fixed mindset of kind of what your own abilities will be, how scared you are about the uncertainties, what risk you're well, you're willing to to say. And I, you know, of course, there are some situations where no is the proper answer. I don't want to diminish that, but the point of having a open mindset, a growth mindset to allow you to properly analyze an opportunity and not allowing yourself to turn something down based on, you know, a not thorough evaluation of the opportunity. Yeah. And that, that sort of open mind to learning is so powerful. And, and, you know, when we talked previously, we didn't want to make this conversation all about coronavirus, but at the same time, I have to think like you have to be learning so many things about your organization Mm -hmm. as your workforce is transitioned to uh, remote working as, as so many of your customer and vendors and and all the other businesses you interact with have transitioned as well. Um, How has that sort of uh, played out in your leadership role and what have you learned about your company that you, you didn't know before? I'm so proud of all the employees at Onyx. This is remarkable uncertainty that we're in. And you know, we've asked everybody to work remotely and some of our employees are already remote. So that hasn't been much of a transition for them. Some folks are navigating this for the first time in addition to feeling scared about what might come for them. Mm-hmm. Some folks are in, you know, to have two working parents and they're trying to work on remote learning with their children and shifting hours and yourself included, right? Myself included. Yes. Yes. And yourself included. Indeed. Yourself included. Yes. So there's a lot that um, when I speak to reinventing, there's a lot of reinventing that's going on just on how people are going to get through the day. But I also think that, you know, throughout this, a lot of businesses and a lot of people are reinventing themselves restaurants are reinventing themselves Mm. to be takeout. Um, We're going to be a stronger company for remote work when we get on the end of this. One thing I've had to do is really ramp up communication because a lot of those hallway conversations don't exist anymore. And we were working on communication prior to the pandemic. And this has helped. It's been a forcing function for me to really be thoughtful and intentional about how I can bridge that uh, communication gap. We, of course, are looking at our business. We're going to get much better at the budgeting reforecasting process through this, which will enable us to be better on the other side. Um, We've looked at some additional data that we never looked at before as a leading indicator for our business. So we're getting smarter about what things we can know now in the off season that will help us on the on season. And a ton of employees have stepped up to provide leadership to their peers and to their um, teammates to help them through managing through this uncertainty piece. So, you know, I, I am, I am an optimist by nature. 
Uh, and uh, but I am optimistic that many companies, even though it's a it's a tough transition time, are going to emerge stronger if the underlying business doesn't um, get impacted through uh, through this pandemic. Indeed. Well, those stories of resilience and leadership and opportunity are some of the great silver linings of, of the situation we're in. Laura, it's been great to learn more about you, your approach to business, uh, learn more about OnX and all the exciting things that's happening there. Thank you so much for participating in this interview, for being willing to be the Gilkey lecturer this semester. Hopefully, we can have you on campus in person and do the event as planned at some point soon. We're not there yet, but um, I look forward to that. I look forward to meeting in person, and I look forward to charting your success and counting you as one of the most prominent uh, business leaders here in, in, in Montana. Thank you for sharing some of your time with us. Well, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here um, in Montana. I'm really excited to be affiliated with the university. And I was really excited about getting into the classroom. Um, I love meeting with students and I love hearing their ideas and what they have to say. So I definitely will be there um, post pandemic as soon as I can uh, to interact with folks. So um, I'll be looking forward to that. It'll be a bright spot. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. All right, hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. It's great to have Laura in Montana, and Onyx is clearly a company on the rise. Great thanks to the Gilkey family for supporting the lecture series, and stay tuned for information about the rescheduled live event, hopefully happening sometime this fall. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. And remember that a new angle is supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you would ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps. Our awesome interns, Aspen Runkel and Max Gibson. Jeff Amet, John Wicks, and VTO for the tunes. And finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time. <laughs>